uh, well, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be here, and I'm sorry that I can't do it in German, but I gather it's an international audience. So, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch, aber das ist alles. That's my best German right there. So, it's limited, in other words. Um, I, I want to talk about, yes, the housing question, but sort of uh, also an emergent set of tactics that are coming about. And these tactics come, on the one hand, from the financial sector, which is grabbing land all over, because land, now, whether it's occupied or not, land has acquired extreme value. And on the other hand, the struggles by all kinds of activism, different types of activisms around the world that are fighting around the question of housing. I think I may be wrong, and maybe I'm speaking from an American perspective, though I have a foreign accent in English. Isn't that nice? I am so proud that I have a foreign... This was, a, by the way, if you're confused, yeah. It, it, I brought in something else. But um, um, So I think the housing question, as I was saying, has really exploded on the scene, and there is a lot of work to be done. Just to give you an indication of what I want to also include in my discussion, uh, uh, very powerful financial firms are buying housing across the world. I'm sure that in your city, whatever your city, you're not aware, but a lot of foreign powerful investors, including high finance, are buying up property. Not because they want to do housing, but because a house is a materiality. There is a real search for actually, you know, material stuff, not just, huh? And so when, when you really begin to dig into this subject, it's quite horrifying what you find. I recommend to you a film that was just shown that is called Push. Push as in push. I don't think it's a great title, by the way, for the film, but the film is extraordinary. It's the... the um, the United Nations rapporteur on the housing question, who, with a filmmaker who's very smart and very um, knowledgeable, they have gone around the world trying to understand the housing question as it instantiates in sort of lower income neighborhoods. So not the fancy, et cetera, houses, but very modest housing, housing complexes. And there is one particular, I won't name it, financial firm that is right now, an American-based financial firm, that is right now an owner of vast numbers of big housing complexes. Uh, oopsie, I didn't see that. <laughs> didn't like it. Across the world. And you stand back and you say, a financial firm? Why would they accumulate housing? And let me just give you a critical element that I want to put right up front. It's not simple to understand, but by the time I'm done, I think you will have understood. Um, and that is that high finance today is centered on algorithmic mathematics. We're not talking traditional whatevers. With Algorithmic mathematics, which is a brilliant form of knowledge, it takes physicists, it's complex, it's admirable, it is deployed for great things, but it now is also deployed by big, the big owners of housing complexes all over the world to capture housing. And now I'm, I'm, I just want to leave it at that. I know this is a bit uh, unusual and complex as a, as, a, as a little sentence there, but I hope that I will make it clear as we proceed. Um, now I want to start with this notion that we're makers, huh? we make. Without making, we would be out of, you know, we would not exist. We have made this, which when you think about it, is an extraordinary accomplishment. I am being ironic. We have managed to destroy one of the big, oh I see, okay. One of the biggest uh, uh, internal seas. Look, a sliver, it's basically gone. And it didn't take many, it took 20 years. 
we have managed to melt down <laughs> very quickly also. So I stand back and I say, we are makers, we can make. Now here, little intersection, the power of key codes and aggregations. I just, for those of you who get it, fine, those of you who don't, etc. But there is something about um, uh, uh, a kind of DNA in play. It's not a DNA as we typically understand it. It's kind of logic, a kind of mixture of elements that bring together or that enable a type of understanding. This is for those of you who got it. You, you don't need to, um, to focus on it. Now, one way of starting is to ask the question, what is the steam engine of our epoch? The steam engine didn't change everything, but it changed enough. And it, in that sense, it's a great example in the sense that how complex systems change. They don't change by changing everything. They change by altering certain conditions, enabling new conditions. In other words, we in our present, where we live, we may not have understood that a major transformation has happened. Because major transformations in complex systems don't change everything. They just change a few key elements. And I want to argue that that's where we are at with the housing question. Uh, now, the housing question is a big question, you know, many different aspects, etc. Um, so one way of asking the question for me is, what is the steam engine of our epoch? What did the steam engine do? It can make a new ordering, even though it does not change everything. I think this is a very important point. I'm repeating myself. Uh, that in order to have foundational changes, changes that really alter our lives, it's not the case that everything needs to change. Just a few elements. Um, so I want to start now with the actual subject matter here, and I invite you to look at this graph. So this goes from 201 to uh, 208, 207 really, 208 is here. And it starts with less than a trillion, 919 billions. And in a few years, seven years, it's 62 trillion. 62 trillion, two comments. Uh, that's more at that moment than the global GDP of all the countries in the world. Number two, those 62 trillion are only 10% of the total financialized value in the world, which at that point, 208, now it's bigger, stood at 600 trillion. 600 trillion is not money. If you put together all the currencies of the world, you don't get, in that time, 207, you do not get uh, uh, 600 trillion. You don't. So, I'm hoping that you're a bit confused. You should be, okay? What the hell, to use polite language, what the hell is happening? What are we witnessing? Well, what we're witnessing is an emergent capability that is quite different from what we have known. And it's an admirable form of knowledge, algorithmic mathematics. It has nothing to do with all kinds of familiar measures of the economy. It is really the domain of physicists, but the physicists are working in high finance, they're working, I mean, I'm not blaming them, by the way. They are just developing extraordinary instruments. So a, there is a kind of revolution that has happened. Which is, we can't quite see it, but I'm hoping to illustrate it with some very concrete elements. What I've just spoken about right now, that's the most complicated part of my talk. So those of you who didn't get it, by the end of that, you will, you will. There is a simple version to it all. But I do think that it matters. And I want to emphasize again, those 62 trillion, it's only 10% of the total value of finance at that moment. And those 62 trillion at the same time, at that point, are more than the GDP of all the countries in the world. So you already know that you're dealing with something that cannot be reduced to you know, what countries are producing, to economies. There's something else in play. And that just, I, will, I want to then develop that. Now here is a second element that I would like to put on. Um, dark 
pools, dark pools of finance. That is not my language. That is the language of the head of the central bank of the United States, who declares a few years ago, he says, and besides all the other things, he says, and then we have a number of dark pools. That was his language. Now, dark pools, I don't know if you get the sense in English, dark pools is a, it's almost like <clears throat> a menacing term, dark pools. You don't know what is it. No, this was the head of the Central Bank of the United States. Very, uh, one cannot call him Schwett. Very, you know, state-of-the-art sort of type uh, for that job. When he emitted those words, dark pools, in fact, it was like a little revolution. What is this? Well, what is that? It is that most of the financializing that is happening, most of the, the exchanges of financial values, etc., is happening in privately owned uh, networks. There are a bunch of major banks that have them. You have them in Germany, you have them, I'm sure, in Switzerland. Switzerland is pretty big. Uh, I mean, not tiny country, but big, uh, big finance deal, yeah. Uh, so we are entering a zone where what you think is a house. <laughs> a house is a house, yeah, but it can also function in many different uh, formats. Now, finance, I just want to... Finance as capability, direct and indirect pathways. Okay, now I want to sort of give you a bit more details. Again, what I just have described is the most complex part because we have, but now it becomes a bit simpler. Um, now, there are many, many versions. I just chose to focus on this. And so the, this is very modest housing that the high financial circuit has engaged with. Again, I want to sort of emphasize, we don't expect high finance to be interested in very modest housing. It, it just, it's a new thing. Why are they interested? Because it's sort of assets. It can be transformed by algorithmic mathematics in assets. And I invite those of you who live here in, in Zurich, we are in Zurich, right? Okay, yeah, suddenly I thought, oh my God. <laughs> uh, well, I said there are other towns in this country, so, you know, I just had a moment of there. Uh, but, but uh, and Zurich is, of course, a major financial center, you know that. But this is a kind of emergent mode of doing finance that is unfamiliar to most of us. We have not dealt with this. But it is really, because it's algorithmic mathematics, it can work with just about anything. It's absolutely an extraordinary form of knowledge. Now, modest neighborhoods. I'm just pulling out this, which is the extreme, the one where you think would be least likely that big financial firms would be interested in, in modest little houses? Why would they care about that? Well, because there are a lot of them. Uh, and so here, I, I'm just going to read it with you, the making of instruments that enable the use of modest elements or assets, like very modest housings, to build a powerful financial instrument useful to top-level investors. And so you get the subprime mortgage for low and modest income households is one example. Just one example for those of you who know a bit about mortgages and all of that. The key, second element there, the key is that the source of profits for investors is not paying the mortgage. It's not about that. The reason they're interested is not because there is a mortgage and hence people pay. We're talking very modest housing here. It's something else. So it's not the more They pay on the mortgage. All that is needed is a signed contract. In the United States, just to make it a bit concrete, because I know this is not very easy to understand. In, the, in a period of eight years, eight to ten years, a system was developed which uh, got uh, 15 million households in the United States. I think that's as big as your population, maybe, or not? <clears throat> right? These are households. Signed on. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll buy this mortgage if I can own a house. Yeah, yeah. 15 million. Of those 15 million, 14.5 million went broke. It 
was a crisis. The financiers who were involved did not go broke. They just needed two or three years to construct an asset-backed security. The asset was the little house, but you don't see the house. You just know there is something real there. It's not just. Huh? Uh, and transformed 14.5 million house houses into something that we don't we see the house, but it actually via several mathematical etc complicated steps becomes a field of assets materialities, a toilet a wall doesn't matter. Why? It took brilliant stuff had to do that. Why? Well, the high investment circuit. Not you and I, who might need housing. No, the high investment circuit was telling the financiers, we want asset-backed securities. We do not want derivatives. I don't know how much you know about, but derivatives continue to be the dominant mode. For the high finance, financial circuit, derivatives are out. You derive a value, but say municipal governments, when they get a loan through a financial sector, they get a derivative. A derivative is a very dodgy instrument right now. If any of you has a pile of money and is considering investing, do not go for derivatives. That was a footnote, by the way. I am not an investor, and I'm assuming that most people here are not either. But, but it's being sold to low-income people, so this is just a fact that is very, I think, very nasty. Now, the key is that the source, second element, the key is that the source of profits for investors is not the mortgage. The mortgage is very modest, might be, I don't know, 500,000, a million. That's nothing for high finance. I mean, it's absolutely nothing. It's not payment on the mortgage. All that is needed, as I already repeat, say, sign the contract. <coughs> you don't have to give me any money. And I repeat, out of that, it was like a period of 10 years, 14.5 million households. How many households do you have here in this country? Household, you know, is like a house with people in it. <laughs> how, how, how many households do you have? Three or four million. Okay, we are talking. 14.5 million households. Now, in a big country, the United States is far too big. It really is too big. Uh, th that is a very small number, but it still is a significant number of housing, right? So anyhow, the source of profits, last point here, is the bundling of a large number of these mortgages, mixing, those are low-grade mortgages. High financiers, don't, they don't want that. But they mix it up with high-value debt to sell to them, onto investors, etc., including banks and foreign investors. It worked. This is the most difficult part of my talk, okay? So hang in there. It worked because they were mixed up with high-quality debt. So they camouflaged the fact that they had a, very, a lot of very, very low, low-value instruments hanging in there. Uh, now, here are some of the figures. There were 14.5 million households who were persuaded to sign, I repeat, to sign, yeah, I'll buy this. And they were told, you don't have to pay anything. Just sign. And they collected over 16 million such signatures in a period of seven years. Now, collecting seven, 16 or something like that million signatures, that's, that means you are deploying a little army. I mean, that's a lot of households. So this is also part of the drama here. How quick, how fast, how many. Um, of course, these were all, you know, these people paid nothing, and it was not about a mortgage. Most of them went broke. But it took years, huh? Three, four, five, six, seven years, maximum nine years. So that, you know, that gives time. In the meantime, the high financial circuit extracted what it needed. It got an asset because the high-level investors were saying, give me something that has a materiality in it. Well, a house is perfect. The house didn't exist as house. We see the house. I repeat myself now from what I said earlier. 
the house becomes a field, I repeat, of material elements, a door, a toilet, etc. what I said already earlier. I'm just repeating to make sure that you are with me. Now, here is another way of looking at it, but we're talking millions and millions of households. The instrument also entered Europe. For some reason, after 2009, you cannot find data on this. But here you have data on a few uh, of the countries, and there are more countries involved. It also became a negative, but it didn't have the dramatic presence that it had in the United States. Partly because in Europe, people own their houses often or rent, but it's not a, it's not a market that you have. Huh? But here are some of the figures, etc. I move on. Now, I want to take a little, a little side step. And I want to invite you to look at the title here. Ratio, just read this, ratio of household credit to personal disposable income, 2005. I'm particularly interested in some of these countries here, Eastern Europe. Now, credit. Ich weiß nicht, wie man das auf Deutsch sagt. Kredit? And so in English, credit suggests you have something. But the credit is also a loan, very often, right? So it's sort of an ambiguous term hanging in there, anyhow. But so a ratio of household credit, rather than saying burden of debt, credit. It just sounds so much better. And so I want you to invite you to see this. 2000, take Czech Republic, 8.5%. <clears throat> Five years later, 27? 27% of the, house, the household debt rose to 27%. Uh, Hungary, 11, 39. You know, you see these increases. Now, I also want to say that the United States always likes to be the queen of the domain. So it already was over 100. You know, when this merely starts, look at that. Czech Republic, 8.5. United States, are, and then, of course, now happily 100, and who knows where it is now. But... Um, what are we seeing there? And so I want to come back to credit. Credit is a very dubious term to use here. It should say simply debt. When you say credit, you're signaling money that you can spend. That is really a debt. And so furthermore, the handling of that debt Look to what it led. Again, I just mentioned these two at the top, which are very extreme. From having a household debt of 8.5%, very, very reasonable, going up to 27 in five years, that's high. Hungary, even higher. So there is something here in play, which some of the well-established countries, look at Germany, you know, totally stable, as usual, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70. How did they get that? I don't know. Switzerland is also on my list, but I, I, it's not on this one. But anyhow, um, you know, so, so there is something there that should invite us to think a bit what, what, what's happening there. Now, let me move on here. Now, I then, when I see that stuff that I just showed you, I want to know who owns that debt of those mostly modest households. Well, it took a bit of doing, huh? because they don't announce it. But here you have, so share of foreign currency. This is one, one element in that, who owns that debt. Share of foreign currency denominated household credit. So Czech Republic, very, very. Look at Hungary quite a bit, Romania, you know, over 40%, etc. So there is quite a bit of foreign ownership of that debt. And so my question then becomes, is it the neighboring country? Is it another modest country? Well... Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, major owners of the debt of those households that I was talking about. So, you, you know, a, a pattern emerges. Now, in short, just a way of summarizing what I just showed you, extractive sectors, and you can think, the way I talked about it, of high finance, so sophisticated and beautiful, eh? it also functions as an extractive sector. The traditional bank is commerce. 
it sells something for a price. It sells something it has for a price. This type of high finance sells something it does not have for a price. So it's quite a, quite a brilliant, I don't know if people are still with me here, but anyhow. But the point is extractive sectors can extract even from modest households. We tend to think when we look at high finance, my God, the amounts of money, the grandiosity of it, the, the brilliance and the I don't know what all. Little houses, so I repeat, 14.5 million very modest houses became part of this sort of becoming, you know, being, being taken to function not as houses, but as an asset that could, an asset, a materiality, that could be used as an asset-backed security. In other words, an enormously complex, brilliant, I mean, brilliant stuff, algorithmic mathematics, you say it all, based on extracting from very modest households. No, there is something that, that is alarming in there. Now, here's yet another extractive mode, just to, just to stick with this. I'm, I'm beginning to see in our modernity, this current modernity of ours, that a lot of the most powerful actors actually are extractive. They take. Rather than commerce. Commerce, you make a cake and you sell it. That's not extractive. I mean, they extract to make the cake, but, you know, that's a bit fanciful. So this is very different. And, and this is, the housing question is key because you have so many, and what it basically becomes is a field of actual material assets. So there is a major instrumentality. Now, here is another modality that is happening, and <clears throat> I actually have the top 100 cities, but clearly that will go around the room, so we are stuck with these few. And here, what I want to emphasize, uh, so, Look at the title there. This is Total National and Foreign Investment Volumes. Um, so this is buyers of housing, right? So the queen of the domain, in other words, the object of the biggest desire or the biggest whatever, is New York, and then comes London, Tokyo, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Paris, Chicago, etc. But it's like a hundred cities that are in play. And they are, it's Europe and the, and the, the Americas, and then in Asia, some elements, like Singapore, etc., Shanghai, you know, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a mix of places. So, so these are the volumes. So I want to emphasize, look at these figures. That is simpler than the percentages. So in New York, this is just one year, okay, one year, and every year. So it's 55 billion, right? London, Tokyo, and you go on. Here, I show you. Total foreign investment, foreign. These are foreign investors, right? Again, London and New York are at the head, but you begin to see other types of cities. So Shanghai is there, Sydney is there, Shenzhen is there, Tokyo is there, Amsterdam is there, uh, Melbourne, etc. So it's, a, it's a, the foreign investors who buy, in other words, actors who buy in a country that is not their country, they have a different selection because, you know, it's just a, it's a, bigger, it's a bigger mix of countries that are involved. And again, you see the figures. I want to emphasize that for those of you who are really <coughs> looking at these numbers, uh, this is just an annual measure of growth or decline compared to the prior year. So you see that Amsterdam as one of the highest, and so does Shenzhen. Why? Because London, New York, Paris, Sydney, they were buying it up there before, earlier, than sort of five, seven years, whereas Amsterdam is sort of a newcomer, so it still is very high. By now it also is a lower. I use this particular year because this is when it really takes off. So you see sort of what were the cities that were the most desired. And if you look at the full, I'm happy to send it. I don't know if you have a, I don't know to whom I'm talking here, but uh, I have a list of 100. You might find your city on there. And that's not good news, by the way, but anyhow. Um, now, the total value 
of these types of acquisitions in the 100 top cities. So it's a particular mode of buying, you understand, right? A lot of foreigners, very high end, etc. Uh, by acquisition. This is just acquisitions of existing buildings, not new construction. Huh? So in mid-2014 to mid-2015, it was 600 billion which, you know, is not an insignificant amount of money. And by mid-2015, it was over a trillion. Now, there is a lot to be said about why are they buying, how do they use what they buy. Many of these buildings are empty. They're not all occupied. And I'm going to get to that. I already alluded to it, but I'm going to get to that in a bit. Now, if you take... This is, uh, this is data that it, this is not my data, this is data that comes from very specialized entities that focus on this. The top 100 cities, the top 100 as measured by property investment. In other words, who's buying, what are they paying? It's not the best cities, it's not uh, account for those. 10% of the world's population, it's already significant. 30% of the world's GDP, Ooh, how can it be that big? I mean, that's just a very small portion, you understand, given the world's population. 76% of property investment. Now, I want to emphasize investment. Once a building is part of an investment, it is no longer simply a building. This is what's happening today, huh, given these new modalities that I talked about. So in that sense, the 76% of property investment is a partial measure. It's not all houses in the world. It's houses that are in play in these investment circuits. Now, just to ground us a bit, what is extraordinary here it's not the housing per se and all of that. It's the way even a modest house can now be inserted into a highly abstract, marked by algorithmic mathematics circuit, where it, not, and because, not, because it's not alone, because there are many, many such modest buildings in play, and because we have via algorithmic mathematics, it's no longer a little building. It becomes, transaction, transaction, a field of assets, materialities, a door, a toilet, a ceiling, it doesn't matter. It's material. Why? Because the high investment circuit tells the bankers, the financiers, oh, give me asset-backed securities. Now, I am sure that most of you, if you have a bank and you're making arrangements, you want to save your money in a certain way, they tell you uh, to take other instruments, not asset-backed securities. Asset-backed securities are very desirable. And they are really, it's mostly very rich actors who get them. You and I get far dodgier instruments. We can go back to what those instruments are at some point. But uh, <clears throat> now moving on. Worldwide real estate assets, an asset, in quotation marks, when a building becomes an asset, most buildings are not assets. But what I'm talking about are buildings that become assets. An asset is a very gener generic mode of talking about a value. And in fact, when you buy an asset-backed security that represents a building, you're probably buying the door, the ceiling, you're not buying the whole building. That instrument, not, not, I don't mean the buying of the building, I mean the, the instrument. I hope I don't lose you here, because I know it's a bit, but this is now part of the housing story, uh, so we should be aware of it. Now, worldwide real estate assets comprise nearly 60% of the value of all global assets, including equity, money, and gold. United, uh, $217 trillion is the value of all of those buildings that are in play in this particular form. In other words, a very abstract modality. It's not about owning a little house. The little house can function in two ways. The owner in the little house and the house that has also become in play as part of an asset-backed security. Now, this stuff, you know, is, is a bit complicated to understand, but I'm afraid that some of you will discover that you're stuck with one of those. 
So I want to talk about this because this is an abuse of trust, you know, because m many of the people who are acquiring those, they think they own an actual little house. No, they don't. They own part of an asset, a financial instrument that could go broke. I don't know how many of you have noticed, for instance, that several municipal governments in Europe went broke not too long ago. Many different countries, all at the same time. Poof, they suddenly were all broke. What happened there? These municipal governments thought they had bought a, a loan, a traditional loan. No, they had been sold one of these asset-backed securities. It failed, they all went broke. Most recently, I repeat, the, the, the Italians had a crisis, but the United States also, in Orange County, etc., where a whole bunch who had all been sold the same instrument went broke. Now, the story gets even worse, by the way, uh, and there is a film that I really recommend called, I think I mentioned it at the start, Push, which shows you what is happening. You have to see that film. It really is excellent. Well, disturbing. Now, another question that, you know, when you think of housing, you think of something material, you think of, so, what does all of this stuff that I talk to you about, you know, what does it all look like? Well, it often looks like this. Oh, this is the Tim's, you know? These are all beautiful older buildings, except that little horror there, but maybe some of you like it. <laughs> and you go there, it's full of tourists. I never go there, but there was a journalist who was interviewing me, uh, and he said, just come, come, walk with me. And so I got to hear what the tourists all were saying, and they were all saying, oh my God, look at all these beautiful British buildings. All of these buildings are owned by one Chinese company. Now, there's nothing wrong with a Chinese company owning all of these mostly historic buildings. In principle, for me, there is nothing wrong with that. What is troublesome is the invisibility of that event. We just see these houses. I mean, some are really ugly, huh? But we see these houses, they are there on the Thames. They have been there often for a long time. We assume somehow, you know, I don't know. We don't think that they're all owned by a Chinese company. Uh, and again, I don't have anything against this notion that a foreigner owns it. But there is, what I'm talking about is the speech. Speech is gone. You know, a building used to be, a building had speech. You saw the building, you understood something about it, you, and you were sort of right. Now, you really don't know what you're looking at. So we have, I think I have this here, in Manhattan, the latest version of this is a bunch of very luxury buildings that are not quite recently built, that are all empty. And so people say, ooh, Poor investors, poor developers. No. That empty building delivers more profits. And you don't have the bother of people living in that complain, the, the shower broke, the this, nothing, nothing. Empty building. We have a bunch of them. I mean, it's a very limited number, huh? But they are these big, not beautiful, but you know, they aspire to being beautiful towers and they're empty. So what has happened there? This is another version of what I already alluded to. By algorithmic mathematics, those buildings cease to be buildings like that. They become a mix of assets. And what you are, where the money is really, is there. It's not in selling the property. Because an asset can be oh, continuously, continuously, continuously. So. I'm hoping that something is uh, clear here in what I'm talking about. Now, here's another sort of, this is just a little footnote, but just for the drama of it. So this is London properties purchased by 66,000 of them uh, by overseas companies. We don't have a single one of those companies with a proper name. We don't know what they are. We do know that they are all they all bought it from overseas, and they're all uh, supposedly foreign. 
but it could be, of course, a British company that, is, that has also a home in another country. Now, you can say, well, so what, you know? We can, but my question is rather, Jesus, what's next, you know? And then you look at what happened with these very modest housings, 14 million very modest houses for modest people, which sort of were broke all those people. I mean, the, the owners lost. The investors who were operating at another level gained. This is very disturbing. Um, what we also have in Manhattan, as I was saying, are these buildings. Now there are still lights, and some of them don't have the lights even. We have these dark, unoccupied buildings, which for a city is not great, you know? You don't want that. They may be very beautiful, very well done buildings, but that darkness is not, it's, it's, it's just not good. So 122, 192 countries are owned by people who use shell companies that hid their identities. Nobody's living there. Buying a building, as we know, is an old tradition. If you have dirty money or dubious, dodgy money, buy a flat, buy a building. At least in the United States, I'm sure that in this country that is not the case. <laughs> or is it? But anyhow, in, in Manhattan is a bit of a, it's still a bit of mafia ground. Huh? In New, New York City is a bit mafia. I don't know if people, I mean mafia, I mean mafia actually, not, not murdering, but you know, economic sort of mafia. And here is another one, you know, these are all grand, brand new towers that are all basically empty. And there they stand. And, and again, they are actually making money for the, for the, you know, owners is barely the language here. Huh? It, it's, it's another kind of thing. Now, g beginning to conclude, what are the formats of the future when it comes to the housing question? And here, uh, so sort of thinking of our larger world where most people are poor and are getting expelled from their land, that's one item, clearly. That, that's the most extreme. We here in Europe are not there. But it is something that is, as you know, land grabbing is, there is almost no land now owned by, by original tribes, etc. Africa looks like there's a lot of empty land. Well, empty, it looks empty, but it's being used for plantation, for mining, for whatever, and... Um, and many people have been displaced. So I think this is a broader story. I, I cannot focus on that, but that is part of the story. This is one format of the future. It will not happen in Europe. Europe, as you know, is absolutely unique in how it has succeeded in having what you don't see in the rest of the world, which is multiple, multiple centers. Each European country has multiple, some are very small, but they have deep histories, they have deep knowledges. You know, that is how it should be. That is a good mode. I'm sure you have complaints, but believe me, compared to what it is in Latin America where I grew up, or in the United States where I'm living now, and certainly in some of the Asian and African countries, this mode that you have, which is multiple cities, cities which are small, but they function as cities. In the United States, we have a lot of so-called cities, but I remember when my mother, who's Dutch, and you know, the Dutch have, a, like you do, a certain tradition about housing and the cityness of it all. And my mother, I took my mother to, to what was the center of the town where I was studying, a town of almost half a million people. And my mother stood there and she said, but, but, but where, where is the city? And I said, this, this is the city. This is in America now that I'm talking about. And so Europe is absolutely exceptional in, in how you have constituted cityness. The United States, of course, you have some really great fun cities like New York. I mean, they have problems, huh? uh, like you know, serious problems. But anyhow, so but back to this. Um, so here is sort of a scenario of the future. Again, Europe is not part of this, but much of the world is. So this is sort of the, the semi-informal but often reasonable housing, and then this, this grand set of buildings, you know, two extremes. Uh, this juxtaposition, by the way, there is no place in the world where you can stand 
and the photographer put this together. And each one is real, but they're not juxtaposed this way. Okay, it's not, because I always get asked, so I cover up. I mean, where, where is that? <laughs> no. This is sort of, you know, this is a real photo, and there they mixed actually different high-level urban. I just want to clarify. But that kind of juxtaposition is what we're beginning to see in more and more of the world. Again, Europe is different, huh? but, uh, but it is something that is happening. And of course, when there is no land, many, ma much housing now is built on water. Huh? This is in Asia, clearly. Um, now, we might ask the question, why does all of this matter? about cities, you know, the, the, the negatives, the constraints that I'm talking about. And to me, the city is a space where those without power get to make a history. And there are very few such spaces in the world. Most land in the world, as I started out saying, is owned. There are, you know, big multinationals, there are governments. You, as you know, there are about 30 governments that are buying a lot of land in foreign countries, not in their own country. Uh, so there is something about the city that is an enablement that we don't want to lose. So the, I repeat, the city is a space where those without power also get to make a history. In a city, the poor neighborhoods have standing. You know, they are also makers, they participate, they're often very needed in, in the higher, uh, the richer areas as, as, as workers, as cleaners, etc. Um, furthermore, the capacity of the city in a very partial and temporary way to make us all, whether rich or poor, into urban subjects. Mostly we're not urban, mostly we are many different subjects, right? But there are moments in the city, in a city's daily routines where we all, like the crowded train that brings the workers in or the people in, which includes some high incomes or low income, or the train that takes you back home, right? There are these moments uh, when there is a real mixity, right? And that is very, to me, very important, that we all become urban subjects. Most of the time we're not urban subjects, as I said, in my reading. Uh, and this matters. One instrument in supporting the notion of a civic subject, huh? the civic, beyond wealth versus poverty. Um, so, so that this is sort of, the, the, the city enables this possibility in a way that few other spaces do. Private setups don't enable that. Uh, there are moments, uh, this is a uh, sort of ending now, there are moments in the daily routines of a city when the city can hack, you know, hack as destabilize, unsettle, not hack as a negative, hack as a positive. I don't know if people are familiar with that. Huh? So when you hack all the other more specific subjects, we also are. So the cleaning woman might be standing in a train close to somebody who is a, an accountant. You know, this mixity, this possibility of recognizing each other. I know it sounds a bit romantic, but it isn't. It, it really is a, is a reality on the ground. Oh, okay, I think I, want, I have a whole set of other slides, but I'm going to end this sort of the, the, what is different in terms of the typical trends. And so here I show a few thingies. Uh, maybe I'll just end with these two. Now, this is the United States <coughs> at its best. I don't mean it that way. So look at this, corporate profits after tax in the U.S., etc. right? So, and then you have this formation here. What I want to care about, one is it grows, 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 suddenly totally different. We really have entered, after the 1980s in my reading, in our countries, we have entered a new phase where the accumulation of wealth has just, and this is what this curve shows. Second element that is interesting here, there was a big crisis in the United States and maybe in some of your countries too. Uh, in this period here, you know, the 209, 210, 10, et cetera. So you have this. Now for most sectors, this, they have not recovered. But corporate profits, it lasted like three minutes, you could say, their crisis. And then they were making more money than the rest. This is not typical. Most other situations, in the United States, they just 
stayed here. They lost ground and they did not recover. But corporate profits did. And this is even better. This is corporate assets. Look there, this was the crisis. It lasted three minutes, literally. And then it kept on growing. And it keeps on growing. At the same time, we have more and more people who are poorer in the United States. These are very disturbing trends. Uh, and I, I just want to, I think I, that is my... Oh, right, okay. This will be the last slide then. So this is income share of top 10% earners. In other words, earners is a, you know, those who are, have jobs and are making money. 1917 to 205. So here you have, you know, the jolly whatever epoch. This is after World War II. This, this stretch is when the middle classes get prosperous, the working classes get prosperous. At, in this period, this is 1942, here in the 1980s is really when it begins to go bad again. This was one of the best periods in the United States, and I think you have similar trends, though not as marked, in Europe. This was a very significant time when all kinds of economic sectors, modest economic sectors, mattered. They were contributing. Today we really have a new landscape, and I see the 1980s as marking a transformation. We have entered a new epoch. In our complex worlds and cities, it's not that it gets announced, okay, we're entering a new epoch. No, it's not. Nor do the whatever's come and destroy the whole city so you know, oh my God, we have to make a new city. No, it's the same good old city, but different modes of inhabiting, of using, etc., are happening. So, so uh, I think that in that sense, this curve to me is very illustrative. These are the good times. This is when wealth is concentrated at the top a lot. These are the modest sectors, the middle classes, the prosperous middle class. And then in the 1980s, it begins to go back up. Many Many writings about the United States are still stuck on here. This is who we are. No, we are not. We might as well be this, because really this is very similar. Uh, I think I leave you with that. Oopsie, it doesn't even move. Yeah, OK. This you can read by themselves, by yourselves. The question is, in this whole setup, who are we, the citizens? Thank you.